Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our conservation webinar series. We're thrilled to have with us today, Randall Cass, our bee extension specialist here at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And he's gonna be giving us an overview of bee health in Iowa's agricultural landscape. Uh, so if you have questions as we go along for Randall, feel free to submit them to me in the chat and we'll get to those following his presentation. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us and the virtual floor is yours, Randall. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit about our bee research uh, that we have going on here at Iowa State. Uh, and so I'll be talking a little bit about myself, what I do here as the bee extension specialist for the university. And then I'll be going into a little bit about the Iowa agricultural landscape, uh, what it means for our bees and uh, how different things that we can do to conserve honeybees and uh, native species of pollinator as well. So uh, just to jump into it, here's a photo of me in our demonstration apiary. Um, this is a honey apiary that we, we get honey off of with these honeybees, but uh, some years we also use these hives as research units. So in my role as the bee extension specialist, I was hired to provide extension, go out and give talks like this to folks about uh, honeybees, native bees, and, and what folks can do to support them or to become a beekeeper. Uh, but I've also been able to expand my role. Uh, in 2020, we started uh, producing honey for the first time uh, in, uh, I don't know how long, through the university. You can buy our honey, ISU honey at the bookstore and at the Student Innovation Center for now. So I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, we also started teaching an undergraduate beekeeping class, myself and Dr. Amy Toth. It's the first undergraduate beekeeping class in the course catalog since the 1960s. So I feel really proud of that, bringing that back to Iowa State. Uh, and I didn't mention before, but I'm the first bee specialist for extension, the first extension bee person the university has had since before World War II. So it's been a long time since we've had someone and there've been a lot of opportunities for me to grow the program here. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that. If you're interested in learning more, you can check out our website. Uh, you could just Google ISUB program or, or go to that website that's highlighted here. I'm used to being able to, to interact with people. So hopefully I won't struggle too much, uh, but uh, save questions for the end and uh, I'll be happy to answer them. So in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about a few different things. I'm going to specifically be talking about the Iowa landscape. In Iowa, we do have a lot of agriculture. What exactly does that mean for honeybees and our species of native bee that we have here? Uh, how do we promote pollinator conservation while simultaneously maintaining our, our necessary high level of agricultural production? Uh, so I'm going to talk, then talk a little bit about prairie strips and how those could potentially be uh, a way to do that, a way to find a compromise between conservation and agricultural production. And then what our research in prairie strips means, our, our honeybee research looking at how honeybees do at prairie strip sites, and also talking a little bit about what we've seen in terms of native bee diversity and richness at these prairie strip sites. So let's get into it. Let's talk about bees. <laughs> so I like to show this map. Uh, this is a map of the United States uh, and it is the percentage of land that is dominated by farms in the United States. So this isn't just annual row crop. This also includes pasture land, uh, fruit trees and orchards and that sort of thing. But what, part, what percentage of our land is devoted to farms? You can see there, there's a strip down the middle of the US that's very dark green. Uh, and the darker the green means the higher percentage of the land in those counties is devoted to agricultural production or is dominated by farms. Uh, you can see Iowa is a little bit greener than, than other states. It's one of those major green states. So if the US is 40% dominated by farms, uh, what about Iowa? What percentage of Iowa is dominated by farms? So think about that for a second. Uh, oftentimes people throw out, you know, 50%, 100%. Uh, 
Uh, and the, the actual number is about 85%. I think it's 84.7%. So uh, we have a highly agricultural landscape here in Iowa. And here's another map demonstrating it. This map shows uh, corn and other crops. The corn is in the, the yellow color. And then that, that dark brown is all other crops. And I like to show this map because it compares Iowa a little bit to some of our neighboring states, neighboring Nebraska, Wisconsin, Minnesota. You see, although those are known agricultural states, they don't have, uh, we've got a lot in Iowa. 84.7% um, of our, our acreage is, is uh, devoted to crop production. And that means 9.4 million hectares of corn and soybeans here in Iowa. So a lot of our land is in agricultural production. That means it's not natural landscapes. It's not a lot of potential natural habitats for wildlife and specifically for this conversation for uh, honeybees and native bees. So what does that mean for our bees? Uh, it says honeybees here, but I mean native bees as well. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means for both types of bees. Here is a, another map, so I hope you like maps. Here's a map of the United States. Uh, this is a map that was put together by the Bee Informed Partnership, which is based out of the University of Maryland. Every year they take a survey of beekeepers uh, to, to have them quantify their colony loss that year. And this map focuses specifically on overwintering losses. Um, and so you can see uh, for the winter of 2020 to 2021, Iowan beekeepers lost, uh, on average, almost 60% of their hives. I joke when I go and talk to beekeeping groups, I say, hey, Iowa's number one. Yeah, we're number one for overwintering colony loss. Iowa uh, is a tough landscape for our bees. Uh, most of the land is in agricultural production, and we can see the impact it has on our bees by comparing our overwintering losses to some of the nearby states. If you look at Minnesota, they only had a 31% reported loss. And you know, Missouri, 34. And yet we're you know, almost 60. That, that, that's really high. And these numbers are pretty consistent. This was an exceptionally bad winter, 2020 to 2021. But on average, talking to beekeepers, looking at these surveys, we see in general a close to 50% loss every year here in the state of Iowa. This is another map that shows native bee abundance across the United States. So the dark blue parts of the map are looking at places where we have high native bee abundance and the yellow parts of the map are showing where we have low native bee abundance. Now, where does Iowa, what color is Iowa on this map? Well, Iowa's right there in the dead center, maybe one of the most yellow states on there. Uh, we have very low native bee abundance. And this is due to the fact that so much of our land is uh, devoted to agriculture. And that means we have very little land that could be potential habitat for many of our native species. Uh, many people don't realize this, but in Iowa, we have between three and 400 species of native bee. Honeybees are not among them. Honeybees were brought over by Europeans. So they are not a native bee species to the, to the Americas. But uh, when it comes to native bee species, I'm talking about different species of bumblebee, uh, those little green sweat bees that you'll find on yourself licking your sweat in the summer. And many of those bees are, don't live in large colonies. Uh, bumblebees live in colonies, uh, honeybees live in big colonies, but most of our native species of bee are solitary bees. They need habitat to make their nests in the ground or in uh, stems of plants, dried out stems of plants is where they like to nest as well. And so uh, with a reduction in habitat for native species of bees, we're not only losing foraging resources for them, and by that I mean blooming plants that produce nectar and pollen, which are their primary sources of food, but also nesting habitat for our native species of bee. They, they need that, that ground and those stems to nest in. Now, this is a, a diagram I put together that uh, goes over stressors that affect honeybees, but there's a lot of overlap between the stressors that affect honeybees and native species of bee. So I'll go over, uh, so we're seeing these, the, the low amount of bees in our area, and here's a lot of the major reasons why. 
First, uh, poor landscapes, and that's kind of a vague term, but what we mean by that is if a lot of our land is in agricultural production, that means that there is a lack of forage uh, for our bees. That means that there are uh, fewer foraging resources from the early spring when the bees start going out to forage to the late fall when the bees are, are still out and about. With honeybees, if it's above 40 degrees outside, they're gonna be looking for food. And in our landscape, where most of our land is devoted to ag, we are putting herbicides on weeds that could be potentially potential floral resources for the bees. And even some of our agricultural crops like soybean that produce a flower that provide nectar for the bees, um, it's only flowering for a very short period of time. In, in our area, in my area here in Ames, it's usually around the month of July, we'll get soybean flowering for a few weeks in our area. And that's a boon for our bees. It provides good nectar for our bees to make honey, but that's just a short window of time for that flowering plant. And after it's done flowering, we get into the late summer, early fall, where we almost become we, what we call a green desert, where there's just not a lot of floral resources for our bees. Another stressor would be obvious, which is pesticides, where we have agricultural landscapes, we're going to have higher rates of pesticide application. And in this context, we're mostly concerned about insecticides used to control insect pests. In an agricultural landscape, our bees are more likely to accidentally be exposed to insecticides that are being applied to fields and then become uh, non-target victims of these insecticides. In many cases, the bees won't necessarily die as a result to uh, pesticide exposure, but they might bring insecticides or pesticides back into their colony, which could over the long term have negative effects on the, the general colony's health as well. Viruses and bacteria and fungi are a big problem inside colonies. If one of my colonies has uh, is in an agricultural landscape without a lot of uh, foraging resources, and potentially exposed to insecticide, that could weaken the hive and make them more susceptible for other things to move in, like bacterial diseases, like different viruses. And in this way, all of these different stressors work together synergistically to bring down our hives. Again, once the hive is weak, different insect pests can move in. Uh, things like wax moth and small hive beetle will lay their eggs inside a hive. Those eggs will hatch and the larvae will chew through everything. They will eat bee larvae, they will eat the honey stores. Uh, and they can really affect a, a weakened hive. But the main uh, issue that beekeepers face across the country, across the world even, is uh, the varroa mite, known as varroa destructor. Uh, this is a parasite that lives inside the colonies. It completes its life cycle in the capped brood of the bees. And what it does is it feeds on pupating bees as they're growing, um, and it can jump from bee to bee and spread different viruses between the bees. Uh, the uh, varroa mites are something that beekeepers need to be checking for regularly. It's something that they need to be treating for. And so uh, getting varroa under control is, an, is another factor that stresses our bees out. And finally, I hate to point the finger, but sometimes we beekeepers are, are poor managers of our hives. We're placing them in bad sites where there's not a lot of forage uh, throughout the season. Uh, we're not keeping an eye on them. We're not checking for mites and controlling those mites when we can. Uh, and so uh, beekeepers hold some of the blame for how our honeybees are managed and how well they thrive in these environments. So considering all of this, considering the Iowa landscape, considering all these different stressors that affect our hives, uh, we wanted to do some research to see uh, what, what are some potential ways to alleviate some of these stressors for our bees. Here, I've got some of my researchers in a prairie landscape. We were looking at how well the hives do in prairie sites versus uh, agricultural sites. Um, and related to that is the research uh, that we've done related to the STRIPS project. So for those of you who don't know about the Prairie STRIPS project, it's a project uh, in conservation ag that was pioneered here at Iowa State University uh, by Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore. STRIPS stands for Science-Based Trials of Row Crop Integrated with Prairie Strips. So essentially the idea behind it is taking row crop fields and planting permanent strips of prairie into those fields. Um, now those strips of prairie can have a lot of positive environmental effects on the overall area, you know, they have roots that dig in deep, they can help with erosion and loss, and actually their impacts on the crop field are pretty 
enormous. Uh, through the research over the past decade, they've seen 44% reduction in water runoff. So we're losing less water out of the fields, 95% reduction in soil, soil loss, which, which is a huge, huge deal because Iowa soils are fantastic and we need to maintain them. Uh, when it comes to fertilizer runoff, which is a big problem in the Mississippi River, uh, we see a 90% reduction of phosphorus and 84% reduction of nitrogen. And on top of that, these aren't acting as reservoirs for weeds. We're not seeing a difference in weed abundance in the field. So this is a, a project that has high potential to reinvigorate our agricultural systems, help us maintain our good soils and reduce the negative impacts like fertilizer runoff uh, that we see in our farms in Iowa. Uh, on top of that, uh, in, the, in the research that they've done, that uh, Dr. Schulte Moore has done, uh, they uh, haven't seen a reduced yield per acre. And we've seen an increased pollinator abundance by over threefold which is really exciting. And these were just some of the preliminary results. And we were interested to see, okay, how do honeybees do at prairie strip sites? Oh, but before I get to that, um, this is a, a great recording that shows the difference between a prairie strip site and a non-prairie strip site through the power of audio. So I received these slides from Dr. Matt O'Neill. Someone went out into a field and recorded what it sounds like when you stand in the middle of a cornfield in the early season, as you can see here. Uh, what, what do the flora and fauna sound like at this site? So let's listen to that. This is just a regular field. You can hear, you can hear a little bird chirping, maybe, maybe a little buzzing. So it's so pretty straightforward. A lot of us have been out in a cornfield in the spring, uh, early summer. We, we know what it sounds like. Now, what, is a, what does a field sound like when you have prairie strips in that field? You can hear a lot more uh, bird calls. You can hear a lot more buzzing, a lot more activity. Uh, I really like these slides because they, they demonstrate uh, the major impact that prairie strips can have, um, not only in what we see in terms of blooming flowering plants, but also just the, the wildlife that seems like it's returning. Um, I've had farmers that have prairie strips report seeing a lot more animals, things like mink uh, at their sites. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. But what does it do for, for our honeybees? So Dr. Gud Jang is part of his PhD research here in the, in the lab of Dr. Matt O'Neill, uh, put together a study. He placed hives at a control site, which was hives at a field edge of a, a crop site where there were no prairie strips present. And so that's represented in blue. And then he placed hives at a field edge where there were prairie strips present. And that, that's represented in orange. And he wanted to see how well the hives did there. Now, how do we measure a hive doing well? Well, there's a lot of different indicators that bee researchers can look at. They can look at the population of bees at the sites. They can look at the amount of uh, eggs that the queen is laying. But one of the easiest indicators of hive health is how much honey is that hive collecting? Uh, if, a, if a hive is collecting a lot of honey, that means that they have a robust population, a very active population. It also means that they have a lot of good resources nearby to collect nectar from and turn it into honey. So for us, that has been uh, one of the primary indicators we like to look at. And, um, and, and so that's why we design our research this way. And I'll be showing the results of, of, of how much honey the bees have been putting on by uh, looking at hive weight. So what we do here at Iowa State is throughout the season in our research projects, we'll visit our hives every other week and we will weigh them to get a good idea of how much honey the hives are putting on. A heavier hive means more honey. Uh, and we can kind of track it throughout the summer. Our bees start becoming active around May and they start collecting nectar and putting it on. And usually they get heavier and heavier until around July and August which is where with the time when beekeepers will usually take honey off. So uh, let's look at some of the results. Again, the, the orange is the, or the red is the prairie strip site. The blue is the site without prairie strips. And this is hive weight in kilograms. And we can see that our hives got heavier, significantly heavier at prairie strip sites when compared to the control site. 
Uh, this potentially means that the bees in the prairie strips are collecting more nectar. They have more robust populations, more floral resources, and they're able to put on more honey, which is great for both the hive and the beekeeper. Now, we presented this data to beekeepers, really excited about it, but they pointed out that in this experiment, we only had uh, two colonies at a site. Sometimes we had four colonies at a site. Commercial beekeepers keep 20, 25 hives in their apiaries during the summer. So they wanted to know if you scaled this up from two or four hives to more like 20 hives, would we see the same result? Do the prairie strips have a good carrying capacity to expand the number of colonies we keep there and still see these same results? So in 2021, we, uh, we did a, a, a different version of Dr. Jang's research project where we put 20 beehives at three different prairie strip sites and we collected information about their weight again, uh, inspecting them regularly. Uh, but so here's a, a photo of a very beautiful frame of bees and a beautiful brood pattern uh, and a lot of our, our team inspecting our hives at one of these prairie strip sites. And so what were we able to see when we increased the number of hives at the prairie strip site to 20? Did we see the same results? Um, Here's some photos through, that I took throughout the year of the hives getting larger. So in that you can see the hives in May, they're, they're just one box or one deep. And in July, they've got two, some of them have three. And actually by August that year, I was running out of beekeeping equipment to keep up with how fast these hives were growing and how much honey they were putting on. So uh, th this graph I, I just threw together, it's not the best, but um, what we see from looking at hive mass when we have 20 hives at the prairie strip site are hive mass results that were really similar to what Ga Jang saw. Um, here's our results from 2021 compared to Ga Jang's results from 2017, 2018. Uh, and you can see that they all follow this similar pattern where they, they put on weight up until August, then they start to lose weight. Um, they lose weight. Uh, often, well, both because beekeepers are taking honey off of the hives, but also because there's not a lot of floral resources come September. Um, outside of the prairie strips, uh, it becomes more or less a green desert for the bees. But with prairie strips present, we see some things late season flowers blooming like goldenrod that actually provide the bees with a little bit of a buffer. They kind of bounce back and gain weight into October as a result of some of these late season native flowering plants that we see in prairie strips. But most exciting is to find out that even if we increase the number of hives from four to 20, we see the same kind of results in the amount of honey that these bees are producing. So this holds a lot of potential for recommending prairie strip sites as a site for beekeepers to keep honeybees, uh, which is really exciting for us. In addition, the honey that we get from the prairie strip sites has its own unique color and flavor profile, which means that beekeepers could potentially market it, prairie strips honey as a conservation ag supporting honey with a special unique flavor that's unique to our state, unique to, to our prairie flowers. We got the honey, the, the honey is sent to a lab to be analyzed, and we know that when our hives are kept at prairie strips, we're seeing nectar come from a lot of native species of flower like coneflower, and that affects the flavor and color of the honey. So uh, potentially beekeepers could market their honey as prairie strips honey and maybe upcharge a couple bucks because it's something special or a niche market type of honey. And so those are some of the things that we're gonna be exploring in the next couple of years is uh, consumer interest in prairie strips honey. Now, I've done a lot of talk about honeybees and our research with honeybees, but what about native bees? Now, I'm more of the honeybee guy. Uh, I'm not currently active in a lot of the native bee research, but I do work a lot with the lab of Dr. Amy Toth, uh, and I'm familiar with some of the research that's been done in strips with native bees, and so I'd like to highlight that for you. Uh, a several years ago, they put out what we call pan traps in the prairie strip site versus non-prairie strip site. These are brightly colored bowls filled with soapy water. It attracts different bees to them because the bright colors make them think that they're flowers. Then they get trapped in the soapy water and our scientists can go and count the number of different species that are there at the different sites. 
And what they were able to find is that there's a significantly higher abundance and richness of native bees at these prairie strip sites when compared to your average crop field. So that's exciting. But pan traps are only one way to look at, at the diversity and richness of native pollinators. But there are some better methods out there, like walking uh, a transect down the strip. You just walk the strip and, and you observe you make floral observations about the different plant species that are there and you make uh, observations about the different insects and in this case native bees that you see landing on those different flowers. And that's exactly what a PhD student Kate Borchart in the lab of Dr. Amy Toth did uh, in 2021. So she was out walking these prairie strips uh, every other week from July to September in her obser floral observations and in insect observations, uh, she was able to observe uh, 800, over 800 native bees and identify 88 species. Uh, on top of that, in these strip sites, she identified 75 different species of plants. And this is what she saw. She would observe uh, what type of bee was visiting what type of plant and make notes of it. So in this graph, uh, the, I, I have two different graphs here. In the pink one, which is the strips, the top bar represents the number of different species of bee that were observed. And the bottom bar represents the number of different species of plants that were observed. And all the connections in between them represents the, the visitation, the, the interaction that was observed between the different native species of bee and the different native species of plant. You can see there's a high level of native species of bee and native species of plant represented in the prairie strips graph. Then if you look at the blue graph, the crop field graph, you see many, and you see fewer species of bee in the top bar, you see fewer species of plant in the bottom bar, and just overall fewer interactions happening. So what we're seeing is a lot more species of plants and bees in the prairie strip and a lot more interactions, which we think means potentially healthier bees because they have a higher diversity and abundance of different plants for them to forage on. So to summarize, uh, strips provide colonies with, with better forage than our control sites. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter if we have four honeybee hives at the strip site or 20 honeybee hives at the strip site, we see the same amount of weight gain. They're, they're putting on a lot of honey there. So the carrying capacity of the prairie strip sites is very high for the number of honeybee colonies we could put there. Uh, the strips increase the diversity and abundance of native bees as well as native plants. And there's a lot of niche market potential for prairie strips honey, which we're really excited about exploring. So that's what our research says. Uh, your average Iowan, uh, what, what, what can they do to support bee populations? So here I have a, a few different things, which include doing things like planting uh, native plants, uh, native flowering plants in your garden. Consider putting in a pollinator garden at your site. Uh, if you have large swaths of land um, that you're not quite sure what to do with, programs like the Conservation Reserve Program have contracts that will pay people to put their acreage into uh, conservation habitat. And in many cases, this can be better habitat for our bees. Remember, native species of bee are most likely to be ground nesting bee. Um, and so they don't only need those flowering plants, but they also just need the open ground where, where they're able to lay their eggs and start their nests. If you are on a small property, but you have a lot of ornamentals in your yard, you can reduce or eliminate the use of aesthetic uh, insecticides that might be harming the bees, not because they're the target of the insecticides, but because they might be visiting those plants to, to pollinate uh, or to collect, uh, to forage, and might become uh, secondary victims of those pesticides. And then talk to other people about bees. A great way to do it is uh, creating a, a honeybee hotel you know, a, a bundle of, of, of stem nests, create a stem nest or a block nest uh, for those, those tunnel nesting bees, uh, provide them with a little more habitat. And it also functions as a, con uh, as a conversation piece with your neighbors. Uh, so those are some of the, the simple ways to get involved and to create better habitat for our bees. Uh, I'm borrowing this uh, calendar from Michigan State University. Michigan State developed this calendar that has a list of a lot of native species of flowering plants that are insects like. Uh, if you are interested in looking at this calendar more, you can uh, look at the nativeplants.msu.edu website to see what plants are going to be flowering when uh, and different plants that you can plant to attract not only bees and pollinators, but also natural enemies 
and ensure that you have flowering plants throughout the year. Because especially here in Iowa, we don't have a lot of plants in the early spring when our bees need it. We don't have a lot of flowers in the early spring when our bees need it. And we don't have a lot of flowering plants in the late fall or in the late summer and early fall. And so the more we can plant things that bloom in early spring and, and bloom in late summer and early fall, the better off it'll be for our bees that are running out of uh, forage in those times of year. That is my presentation. And I know that um, we're gonna go over some of the details um, with uh, Iowa Learning Farms, and then I will be happy to answer any questions folks have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Randall. If you wanna go ahead and do the next slide. Oh yeah, I forget I'm, I'm in charge. <laughs> All right, so thank you all for attending today. If you did intend to get a CCA CEU from attending today, please be sure that you send the following information on this slide to Elena Whitaker, that's A-L-E-N-A-W at iastate.edu by 5 p.m. today to ensure that you get that credit that includes your name, the name you watched, entered to watch the webinar, if it's different, and your CCA number, and she'll get that sent in for your credit. All right, and so if you've been a long time webinar viewer, uh, you've probably seen this slide as well, but we're asking folks to fill out a voluntary demographic survey. Uh, you can access that one of two ways, either the link there, iowalearningfarms.org slash survey, or scan that QR code. If you have already completed this for this calendar year, we greatly appreciate it. You only need to do it once. However, if you have not done it, uh, it's pretty short and quick and painless, uh, but it does help us um, know who's participating in our programs as a USDA funded program. All right, and then up next, you can join us for our next webinar on Wednesday at noon, and that's how do cover crops impact residual herbicides in corn and soybeans. So you can check that out. We'll have Bill Johnson here from Purdue University. And there have been some questions that have come in, but if folks have additional questions, feel free to get those uh, submitted. Okay, so the first one that came in was commenting that we've seen a massive increase in fungicide use across the state. Uh, aside from them being toxic themselves, especially to cell member metabolism and endocrine systems, there are mixed with insecticide quite often. Have you seen any research on this particular topic? Yeah, absolutely. There is research done on this that shows that uh, fungicides and insecticides have a, a work synergistically. So um, a, a particular fungicide might not uh, have too much of a negative impact on honeybees on its own, but when mixed with uh, certain insecticides, research has shown that the two of them work together to create sort of a, an even stronger stressor than they would be by themselves. Um, I, don't, I don't have any of the research on hand with me, but yes, that research has been done and scientists think that there is a link between uh, this mixing of insecticides and fungicides having a synergistic, more powerfully negative effect on on honeybee health, um, so yeah, that 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 is a that is a concern because um, fungicides applied alone aren't aren't as toxic as whenever they're applied in conjunction with certain insecticides. Um, let's see. Would you expect an increase in the number of beneficial predator insect species with with the utilization of prairie strips as well as the impact to honeybee or to bees in general? I I would like to I would like to think so. Um, I know that. Um, some research has been done looking at non-bee species in the prairie strips. Currently in Dr. Matt O'Neill's lab, they are looking at different predatory beetles that are, are there in the prairie strips. So there's promising potential research to come out of that. And in addition to those beneficial uh, predators, um, a lot of research has been done showing that the surfid fly population increases. Now, surfid flies, a lot of people, they're, they're black and yellow. They're often, many of them are kind of bumblebee or wasp mimics. They can't sting you, uh, but they do, they are hairy and they do help with pollination a little bit. So we've also seen an increase in surfid fly populations in there as well. And research is ongoing to look at some of these uh, different uh, beneficial predatory beetles and their diversity and abundance. But we, I don't have the data on that right now, but hopefully we will in the next year or two. So continuing on the prairie strip side of things, uh, is there a certain size of prairie strip that is more beneficial or is any size helpful for the bees? Right. Um, oof, that's quantifying the acreage of habitat and how well it will benefit our bees is, 
is very difficult. Um, there's no rule of thumb about uh, number of plants per acre, acre versus no quantity of hives that you plan to have at a site. Um, our sites have been of a varying acreage, and I know that the recommendation for prairie strips is to take a, around 10% of the land out of production and put it into prairie strips. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you know, let's say a site is 10 acres, so one acre is put into prairie strips. Uh, we're seeing uh, benefits at least at that level. Um, I don't know what it would look like if it was one tenth of one acre, but but honestly, um, any increase in habitat I, I see have, has a lot of uh, positive potential, um, even if not just for nectaring and uh, nectar and pollen resources, but also potential nesting habitat for a lot of our species of native bee as well. So while I can't put a specific number on the quantity needed or the size or area needed. Um, uh, I, I, any amount I see as, as having a lot of potential to be beneficial. And this is a good one. Why should honey beekeepers care about native bees? Oof, why should honey beekeepers care about native bees? I, I, um, I don't know. I, I think that most honey beekeepers don't negatively view native species of bee. Uh, there are a lot of concerns recently, uh, especially with, through organizations like the Xerces Society, that show that in a lot of ways, honeybees are an invasive species in the Americas. There's a lot of potential in certain areas for honeybees to outcompete native species of bee for resources like nectar and pollen. So uh, I try to promote awareness among beekeepers. Uh, for example, um, we haven't, using pan traps at our sites, we haven't seen a drop in the diversity and abundance of native species that we catch in our pan traps, whether we have honeybees at our site or there's not honeybees at the site. We looked at both sites and we saw pretty similar levels of native species. But that was when we had eight to 16 hives at a site. Now, if a beekeeper, especially places like Northern California, where all the commercial honeybees go to do almond pollination in February, I imagine having thousands and thousands of hives per acre uh, at that time of year probably has a negative impact on native species. And maybe the, the beekeepers probably don't care too much about it because that's their major money-making time. Um, but I would say that, that in order to have uh, thriving ecosystems, we need a, a higher diversity and abundance of species, whether that's other insects, whether that's plants. And so I think that coming at it from an ecosystem's angle might be a way to, to promote it um, with uh, beekeepers. So a specific question about some research here. The audio um, is asking if that was from Adam Dixon's research and if there's a recap of his project anywhere or if you're familiar with that. I, I am not sure where the audio came from. Um, there's a lot of us doing prairie strips research. There's bird people, there's bee people, there's erosion people, there's uh, fertilizer runoff people, soils people. And so uh, Dr. Matt O'Neill, maybe got it from, from Adam Dixon uh, and I got it from him. We're just passing around uh, good slides that we have, but um, uh, I, and I do not know much about, about his research. So uh, yeah, I just like the slide a lot. Um, so specifically here, has there been any study on woodlands and what kind of types of trees might be best for either honey or native bees? Yeah, um, not a lot of woodland research has been done here in Iowa. Um, there is some research that has been done. Um, I'm thinking of. Um, well, that doesn't that doesn't really relate. No. Um, so th this that that would be a potential uh, additional area. A lot of beekeepers say that their hives do well near woodland sites where we have a lot of um, different types of native species growing. And so that, that would be a, a good um, next area to explore. Although, you know, 85% of our land is ag. So more than likely, wherever people place their, their honeybee hives, 
or wherever native bees find a place to form a nest, there's gonna be an agricultural landscape, probably corn or soybean adjacent. So um, figuring out the best ways to promote pollinators in the agricultural areas, I feel for Iowa is, is where we're gonna see the greatest impact. But I, I would like to do more things with woodlands. So this question is related to aerial spraying um, of various chemicals. How prevalent is a spraying detrimental to pollinators versus maybe spraying that isn't harmful and maybe it's how it's done as well as what is sprayed. Right, so the, the better precision that we can use for uh, pesticide applications, right? Because pesticide applications aren't gonna be going anywhere. So what we can do best is try to find some sort of compromise. That can include things like better precision nozzles. We keep our hives, that, that photo of me in here, I'm out at the horticulture research station, which is just north of Ames. And there they have all sorts of fruit trees, mostly apples, some pears, and they spray them a lot, uh, which has me worried about my bees because they are spraying things like insecticides on them. So when I talked to them about it, um, they showed me their precision nozzles that they have. So, so as they're able to drive uh, their tractor with the, with the sprayer behind, pulling the sprayer behind them, uh, it has a, a sensor on it that can sense when there's a tree, when there's a branch, when there's fruit, and it offers more precision sprays onto these fruit trees rather than just coating the, the whole row in a giant cloud that could potentially drift over to where my honeybee hives are. So there are a lot of methods for increasing precision, especially with things like, like fruit trees, which is gonna reduce the overall amount of insecticide that's put into the environment and reduce the amount of insecticide that could potentially drift onto our bees. Um, and so that's, that's one way I see of increasing precision. Um, another solution that has been, had mixed results is the use of systemic insecticides on seed coating. You know, the idea being that you coat the seed with these insecticides that will then be taken up by the plant and produced in the plant. And that's gonna reduce the amount of aerial sprays or, or, or um, a spraying that, that has to happen later in the season. And while that has been, uh, effective in a mixed way in terms of timing. You know, in Iowa, sometimes we see that when the systemic insecticide is most active in the plant, there aren't any aphids or other insect pests in the soybean, for example, uh, as it's its most effective. But that would be another potential route for, for reducing aerial sprays and, and creating, uh, making non-target organisms out of honeybees and other native bees. But that comes with the caveat of a systemic insecticide producing this insecticide in its pollen and in its nectar that the bees then take back. Um, so it's a it's a trade-off and there's no there's no one single answer. Um, it, it, I think that the better the best plan is to, to come up with better better precision um, uh, in the way that we apply our insecticides to reduce drift. All right a couple last questions here. How often can a bee visit a flower bloom and get the nectar before it's all gone? Oh, that's a good question. It depends on the flower. It depends on the weather. Flowers will re, uh, produce more nectar from day to day. It's not just one time that they can visit. You know, it'll produce nectar, a little bit of nectar each day um, in many cases. And so bees can go and visit a flowering plant multiple times while that plant is still flowering. Uh, one caveat would be uh, if it's raining, sometimes that can wash the nectar out. Um, and, and again, this speaks to the competition that uh, could potentially happen between bees that are all fighting for the same resource that they're running to get to each day and trying to beat each other to. But yeah, they can get they can visit flowers many times throughout the season while that flower is blooming. All right, final question here. Your thoughts on no mo may? It's gotten a good amount of media attention. Have you or others been able to quantify any benefits to honeybees and or native bees? Right. Um, no mo may is. Good, but, uh, and this is something that I've talked to my colleagues about, uh, we think mo less may is probably a better alternative. Yes, in early spring, especially the, the month of April, the month of May, there aren't a lot of flowering plants for our bees. And one of the, a, a great and important flowering plant that we see early is the dandelion. And we see dandelions in our yards. So um, what I suggest we do is, allow those dandelions to grow and flower for several days before we go ahead and mow. I, I'm a big, uh, I, I support mow less May. Uh, 
Because honestly, if you, so, so because there, there are important weeds in that early crucial season for our bees and they really need them. But the truth is if you were to just not mow for the whole month of May, you could end up killing your lawn. If you have too much above ground growth on that grass and then you mow it, that can oftentimes kill the grass. And so you might not have the outcome that you want. So that's why I, I, I'm a supporter of the concept of mow less May because then you get the best of both worlds. You get to maintain your lawn without killing it. Uh, and you also get some of these uh, flowering plants like dandelion in the early season that are vital for our bees. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Randall. And you've got your contact information up there. So if people have additional questions, they can reach out to you. We appreciate you taking your time today. And any final words before we sign off? Um, yeah, go. I, I'm a honeybee guy. But when I talk to people about save the bees, I'm trying to talk to them about native bees. We've got almost 400 species of native bee here in Iowa. So I highly recommend talking to people about it, trying to figure out ways to create better habitat for them. Because we can control our honeybee population a little bit, but we can't control our native bee population. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.